Hi, I'm Roy Thurley from Balfour 100. I've spoken at a number of places around the UK recently, giving the history of the Balfour Declaration and its impact. Many times I've been asked if the talk is on video. Well, now it is. It's quite long, but then we are covering well over 100 years. In fact, we'll start almost 2,000 years ago. What we're going to do is begin with the link between Jews, Christians, and the geopolitical scene, which sounds complicated, so I'm going to try and make it very simple. Here we have, first of all, a timeline of Jewish history since the year 70 and the destruction of the Second Temple. In 1290, King Edward I decreed that all the Jews should be expelled from Britain. 365 years later, 1655, Oliver Cromwell put a decree before his Council of State to allow the Jews to return to Britain. And here they settled in again and were gradually accepted into British society. From the late 1800s onwards, we see Jews returning to their promised land, which was then called Palestine. So all this period is a time of exile in terms of the Jewish people. But throughout this whole period, the Jewish people were longing for a return to Zion. Next year in Jerusalem was the cry every Passover. From a Christian point of view, I'm beginning with the Reformation in 1517. And one effect of Reformation was that the Bible became accessible to ordinary people in their own language, instead of being filtered through a corrupt clergy. And that led to the understanding that the Jewish people should be restored to their homeland. That came to a head in the 19th century. We also have the geopolitical story, which again, I have started from 1517, because that was when the Muslims took control of the land of Palestine. And they remained in charge for the next 400 years. The Ottoman Empire at that time was quite extensive, as shown on the map there. So with that as a background, what we're going to do from here onwards is just to follow through the history from the 16th century onwards, tying together where we can these three strands. So let's look at this clip of what God was doing in the church here around Cromwell's time. For at least 200 years, the evangelical church in Britain had been sympathetic to the restoration of the Jews to their ancient homeland in what was then known as Palestine. The church had for nearly 2,000 years been very anti-Israel, very much in the school of Oregon and Alexandria. But it was actually when Cromwell came to power that we saw a significant change when the ministers that he appointed the church demanded that they went to Holland to study Hebrew so they could translate the Bible. On their return, they not only said that they had a new understanding of Scripture, they said that Israel had to be re-established in that land and that the Jews needed to be allowed to return to Britain. And that was really under the era of Cromwell. And we see that they influenced the subsequent evangelical and Calvinistic movement from Wesley, Whitfield, other such leaders were greatly influenced by the Puritans of that time. During the 19th century, there were many Bible-believing Christian leaders who did have a proper understanding of God's purposes for Israel. This was actually mainstream Christian theology at the time. And we see that in this interview with David Pelagi, who is now the rector of Christ Church Jerusalem. David Pelagi, how strong was the interest within the broader 
Anglican Church in the 19th century to the concept of the restoration of Israel? I would say that uh, within the Anglican Church, not only amongst evangelicals, but even amongst the broad church and the high church as well, or the high church party as it was sometimes known, that there was widespread across the board support for seeing the Jews return to Palestine. And uh, this was not something that was only the preserve of the evangelicals. Throughout the 19th century, British society was philo-Semitic, ironically despite pockets of anti-Semitism. And on the whole, British Christians, especially within the Church of England, but including the free churches as well, and even the Roman Catholic Church, were favorably disposed towards the Jewish people and look for the day that the Jewish people would return to Palestine. Even if many of them were not evangelical and not waiting for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, there was this expectation amongst the British population that the Jews would one day return to Palestine. And this, I think, was thanks uh, in part due to the influence of the Puritans and the influence of the evangelicals, which was quite widespread. And you see it in the poetry of Lord Byron, who was certainly no evangelical, or in the novels of George Eliot, who again was no evangelical. Philo-Semitism was in the air. It was in the water of, of Victorian Britain. David Pelagi mentioned there the 19th century Anglican Church as believing in the restoration of the Jews to their land. Let's listen to part of one sermon from a man who became Bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle. However great the difficulties surrounding many parts of unfulfilled prophecy, two minor points appear to my mind to stand out as clearly as if they were written by a sunbeam. One point is the second personal advent of our Lord Jesus Christ before the millennium. The other of these points is the future literal gathering of the Jewish nation and their restoration to their own land. Out of the 16 prophets of the Old Testament, there are at least 10 in which the gathering and restoration of the Jews in the latter days is expressly mentioned. I believe that there is one common remark that applies to them all. They all point to a time which is yet future. They all predict the final gathering of the Jewish nation from the four quarters of the globe and their restoration to their own land. I ask you then to settle it firmly in your mind that when God says a thing shall be done, we ought to believe it. Amen to that. In the 19th century, Bible-believing Christians had a huge influence on the governments of the time. Just think of William Wilberforce and the abolition of slavery. And these Christian leaders were also influential in putting forward their case for the Jews. Simply put, having studied the Bible, they came to these conclusions. We want to see the coming of the Messiah. But before he can come, the Jews must be back in their own land of Israel. Therefore, we need to get the Jews back to what was then called Palestine. Now, of course, the Jews are looking forward to the first coming of the Messiah. We, as Christians, are looking forward to his second coming. So perhaps... When he comes, we can ask him if he's been before. So those 19th century Christian leaders put their efforts into achieving their object of getting the Jewish people back to the land. Now, I'm sure we have all heard of Theodor Herzl. He was born in Hungary. God moved him to Paris, where he witnessed the Dreyfus Affair, where French anti-Semitism was on show. He later moved to Vienna, where he was a journalist with the new free press. There, he met a Christian man 
who would also become very influential, the Reverend William Heschler. Born in India, God moved him first to London, where he became an Anglican vicar. This is not your normal Anglican vicar's garb, by the way. He was a Bible student, particularly interested in the prophetic scriptures about the Jews returning to their land. God then moved him to Vienna as chaplain at the British Embassy. This next clip gives a secular Jewish view of the early part of Herzl's life. Chief Rabbi Morris Goodman, who had been dismissive of Herzl a few months previously, was now very interested in what he had to say about the problem of anti-Semitism in Europe. A meeting was scheduled in Munich. At an elegant hotel on the Sabbath, Herzl outlined his proposals for the Jewish exodus from Europe and the new state. He shared details from his speech to the Rothschilds. Rabbi Gudeman became so enthusiastic about what Herzl was discussing that he exclaimed to the journalist, you remind me of Moses. Yet despite expressing such sentiments, that evening the rabbi wrote a postcard to his wife. Herzl is a poet. His plan, however interesting, is not feasible. Max Nordau convinced him to make a trip to London, where he was certain there would be tremendous support for his ideas. While Herzl did not know a single person in the city, and his English was limited, within days he was speaking with the leaders of the city's Jewish community and gave a triumphant speech to the Maccabean Club. His first public talk about his views was rewarded with a standing ovation. Herzl left England excited and determined to build a Zionist movement. As soon as he returned to Vienna at the end of 1895, he adapted his speech to the Rothschilds into an 86-page booklet entitled Der Judenstaat, or The Jewish State, an attempt at a modern solution of the Jewish question. In the booklet, Herzl explained why he believed Palestine, for historic and religious reasons, should be the home for the new Jewish state. The Jews have dreamt this kingly dream all through the nights of their history. Next year in Jerusalem is our old phrase. It is now a question of showing that the dream can be converted into a living reality. Herzl also received the almost unanimous endorsement from the Jewish student fraternities at the University of Vienna. At the University of Berlin, a group of Russian Jewish medical students who had been Zionists for years were jolted by Herzl's book. One of them was a 22-year-old named Chaim Weizmann. Reverend uh, William Heschler got a copy of Herzl's booklet, Der Judenstaat, and promptly went to see him because he was so excited. Because of his contacts throughout Europe, Heschler managed to get meetings for Herzl with many influential leaders in Europe, including the Kaiser. Effectively, Heschler was Herzl's foreign minister, if you like. Out of all this came the first Zionist Congress held in Basel in the summer of 1897. And this clip gives an insight into the effect that this Congress had. During the spring, Herzl convened a conference of his deputies in Vienna to organize the Zionist Congress he wanted to hold that August. Among other things, it was decided to hold the conference in Munich, a central location with plenty of kosher restaurants and hotels. But as soon as the word got out about the Congress, trouble began developing. Vienna Chief Rabbi Moritz Gudemann, who a year and a half earlier had likened Herzl to Moses, wrote an attack against Zionism, insisting that Judaism and nationalism were not compatible. In Berlin, the Rabbinical Council of Germany also published a strong statement against the Zionist movement and the plans for a Congress. This led to protests from Munich's Jewish leadership about holding the Zionist Congress in their city. An angry Herzl decided to move the convocation to Basel, Switzerland, where he had more support from the local Jewish community. Herzl arrived at Basel's hotel, Les Trois Rois, overlooking the Rhine, a few days before the Congress was to begin. He quickly rented the Stadt Casino, a well-known concert hall in the small Swiss city for the assembly. 
and then the delegates. More than 200 of them from 17 countries started to arrive. They had come to the Congress seeking a life beyond pogroms and religious persecution. They could hardly contain their excitement over what they believed was about to happen for the Jewish people. They were sure that they were transforming the dream of returning the Jewish people to the land of Israel into a reality. This was the first gathering on such a scale that had taken place for almost 2,000 years. Delegates coming from all over the world, different Jewish communities, meeting in Basel to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine, recognized in international law. The delegates hailed from all over Europe, North Africa, Palestine, and America. There were lawyers from Vienna, bankers from Holland and Sweden, along with professors and students from Germany, as well as shopkeepers from Poland and Hungary. Some were rich and others poor. Many were young men from Eastern Europe and Russia, carrying satchels of food with them from home, prepared by their wives and mothers for the long journey, primarily by third-class rail. The religious mingled with the secular. One group that stayed away was the Jewish aristocracy. And so did the Neue Freie Presse. While more than 30 members of the world press covered the Congress, Herzl's editors, who were angrily opposed to his Zionist activities, chose not to send a reporter and never mentioned one word about the conference in the paper. Herzl's experience in the theater gave him a sense of how to choreograph the event. He personally supervised the lighting, the stage setting, and even how the delegates would dress. That evening, as he walked to the podium to deliver his inaugural address, Theodor Herzl was greeted with the stomping of feet and a thunderous ovation. People reached out to kiss his hand as he walked by. On the stage, as he tried to begin his speech, the cheers of the crowd would not end. One delegate, the Hebrew writer Ben Ami, recorded how among the cheers, one could hear the cries of Yehi HaMelech, long live the king. When he finally got the opportunity to speak, Herzl went straight to the point. He explained that they needed to set up an organization to negotiate with the great powers, and specifically with the Ottoman Empire to achieve Jewish settlement in Palestine on a large scale. Jewish colonization should no longer be conducted in secret and must be in accord with international law. Herzl concluded that the goal of the Zionist Congress was to create a new kind of Jew. At the closing session of the Congress, one of the most emotional moments occurred when Rabbi Cohen came to the podium and recalled how several weeks earlier he, like most of Europe's rabbis, spoke out against Zionism. But now, he explained, that after listening to the speeches of the past few days and meeting with Herzl, he had a change of heart. He was now a supporter of the movement. The rabbi expressed that he had only one concern about the new Jewish state. Would the Sabbath and other doctrines of the faith be kept? Herzl rose from his chair and answered him. Judaism has nothing to fear from the Jewish state. Rabbi Cohen responded that he would now dedicate his life to the Zionist cause. As Herzl announced the first Zionist Congress is now closed, a celebration took place that even the Zionist newspaper Die Welt maintained was hard to adequately describe. Delegates danced and sang while embracing and kissing. Women waved handkerchiefs. Throughout the hall, cries of, next year in Jerusalem, could be heard. The scene went on for more than an hour. In the days following, the delegates meditated on how profoundly the experience had not only changed them, but the future of the Jewish people as well. Not long after its end, Theodor Herzl also reflected on what had been accomplished at the first Zionist Congress. Were I to sum up the Basel Congress in a few words, it would be this. In Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this aloud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. Perhaps in five years, and certainly in 50, everyone will agree. We now come to the period leading up to the Balfour Declaration. Mention was made in a previous clip of Chaim Weizmann, 
He was born in Belarus. He was educated in biochemistry in Switzerland and Germany. And it was while he was in Geneva that he became a Zionist. In 1905, God moved him to Manchester, which was a center of excellence for organic chemistry at that time. But actually, it was really there as part of God's overall plan. There in Manchester, he became a leader in the Zionist movement in Britain. He teamed up with some other Zionists. The group was led by Harry Satcher. He was a journalist on the Manchester Guardian newspaper, which was one of the leading provincial newspapers at that time. Satcher's friend from Oxford, Leon Simon, went on to become a senior civil servant. And also at the group's centre was Simon Marks and Israel Seif. They were ambitious young men in the process of turning Marks and Spencer from a family business into a nationwide retail giant. These men gave themselves the rather grandiose title of the Manchester School of Zionism. The other person to introduce here is Arthur Balfour. So at last we have met the man who was responsible for the declaration named after him. He was born in the village of Whittingham in Scotland. And Balfour later became the MP for Hartford in 1874 and then Manchester East from 1885. In January 1906, there was a general election and Balfour was campaigning on the streets of Manchester and it was here that he met Chaim Weizmann and the two of them became friends. Balfour later became Foreign Secretary from 1916 through to 1919, just as the Zionist campaign was reaching its peak. Many Jews, particularly in Russia, were being persecuted in the pogroms that were happening there. As we have seen, Palestine was under Ottoman rule at the beginning of the 20th century. It was ruled by Turkey as an Islamic caliphate. So Britain offered to settle the Jewish people in Uganda. On one occasion, Balfour met with Weizmann to try to convince him that Britain's plan to settle the Jews in Uganda was far better than hoping for Palestine. Let's eavesdrop on the conversation. But the Russian Jews need a safe haven immediately. Why not British East Africa? The survival of Zionism is based on a spiritual conviction. And that conviction is based on Palestine. And on Palestine alone. If Moses had been here when they had proposed Uganda, he would surely have broken the tablets once again. <laughs> Mr. Balfour, supposing I were to offer you Paris instead of London. Would you take it? <laughs> Dr. Weizmann, we have London. That is true. And we had Jerusalem when London was nothing more than a marsh. Are there many Jews who think like you? I believe I speak the mind of millions of Jews who cannot speak for themselves. If that is so, Dr. Weizmann, then you will one day be a force. So, Balfour became a supporter of the Zionist cause. Despite possibly having some anti-Semitic views, and maybe from fear of the Russian Jews coming to Britain. But whatever his motives, his support for Zionism led in 1917 to what is now known as the Balfour Declaration. Before we get there, however, we come to another problem from within the Jewish community. There was no general agreement on what they wanted. I've recently read this book written by Kathy Durkin, and this really opened my eyes to what was going on behind the scenes in the early 1900s. She identifies three strands of thought amongst the Jews at the time. The first were the assimilationists, typified by Edwin Montague, MP. Their view can be summed up like this. 
The Jewish people have achieved huge gains in being accepted into British society. We have high status, much influence, including MPs like this man. So why rock the boat and talk about Palestine? Because people then will see us as foreigners in Britain, maybe even a fifth column if it came to a war. Secondly, there are the cultural Zionists. The main influence here was this man, Asher Ginsberg, usually known by his pseudonym, Achad Ha'am. His version of Zionism celebrated Jewish identity and culture. He believed that the Jews were not yet ready to establish their own national home. What was needed was a small, self-sufficient settlement in Palestine, one which would be a beacon to world Jewry who would be inspired to follow suit. And then there is political Zionism. This is Herbert Samuel, who later became Britain's High Commissioner in Palestine. And we've already come across this version of Zionism when we considered Theodor Herzl. So where was Chaim Weizmann in this scenario? Well, we know that he attended the Zionist Congress, so he was firmly within the political Zionist camp. However, as we've said, Weizmann had no official position in Britain at that time, and he wanted to hold the Jewish community together, if at all possible. He therefore came under the influence of Achad Cha'am, and began to think also in terms of cultural Zionism. And from that point, he wavered between there and political Zionism, and in the end, we find his view coming somewhere in between and bringing others in the political camp with him. So let's look briefly at what these various camps were saying. This was the view of Edwin Montague for the assimilationists. Zionism has always seemed to me to be a mischievous political creed, untenable by any patriotic citizen of the United Kingdom. You are being misled by a foreigner, a dreamer and idealist who sweeps aside all practical difficulties. Just a few years after the death of Theodore Herzl, the Zionist Congress had moved away from his political agenda to a cultural one. This is what happened in 1911. At the 10th Zionist Congress, a resolution was approved that the goal of Zionism should be a spiritual center instead of a state of Jews. By the end of 1914, Weizmann was talking of cultural Zionism. If the Jews had at present a place where they formed the important part of the population and led a life of their own, however small this place might be, for example, something like Monaco, with the university instead of a gambling hall, nobody would doubt the existence of the Jewish nation. During this time, with the First World War in full swing, Britain's Prime Minister was Herbert Asquith. His style of government was based on much discussion and seeking a wide consensus. So making decisions was a very time-consuming process. But at the end of 1916, he was replaced by David Lloyd George, our only Welsh Prime Minister so far. One of Britain's geopolitical objectives at this time was to protect its major trade route to India. India was a very important part of the empire at this time. That trade route ran through the Suez Canal. If this route was cut off for any reason, it would result in all ships having to sail around the bottom of South Africa, which would be, might take a huge increase in time, in danger and expense. So the area around the Suez Canal was vital to British interests. This next map shows the extent of the territory controlled by our enemies in World War I. And Palestine was therefore seen as being vital to put a stable regime near the canal. As well as this, things were not going well in the war on the Western Front, 
So it was decided to concentrate on the Eastern Front and move north from Egypt. At one stage, David Lloyd George had a very significant conversation with Chaim Weizmann. So let's look at a clip of what happened. Your son. He is bad as that, surely. Not make bricks, that's straw. And now there's a shortage of acetone. No acetone, no cordite. No cordite, no ammunition. It's as simple as that. Perhaps the American firms are manipulating the situation to uh, what the price No, the position is far worse than that. The supplies are simply not there in sufficient quantities. And we can't produce it ourselves. Oh, the amounts of wood alcohol we will be needing will take vast timber forests. The Germans have got limitless supplies. They've got the greater part of Eastern Europe. They've got Serbia as well. No, JT. For the first time, I can't for the life of me see how we are going to stop them. You don't mean that. Oh, yes, I mean it, JT. I mean it. And you're sure about this? Of course I am sure. Otherwise, I wouldn't have wasted my own time and yours by making a second journey down from Manchester. You don't seem to be convinced. Oh, it's not that I doubt your ability, Professor Weizmann. C.P. Scott of the Manchester Guardian told me how highly your work was regarded at the university. It's just that, you see, it's only five weeks since I first outlined the problem to you. But I told you I should be working on it night and day. And you're claiming that this organism will help us to extract acetone from maize on a commercial scale. From any cereal, and with a little adaptation even from non-edible seeds, like uh, horse chestnuts, for instance. And it will need far less bulk of raw material than the wood alcohol process. And you've done this in five weeks, you see. It's too good to be true. I uh, hardly started uh, from scratch, you understand. And breeding bacteria is not like breeding racehorses. <laughs> it's very, very much quicker. Professor, I need hardly say that if this process of yours proves effective, then you will have rendered the state a very great service indeed. And I will make it my own personal responsibility to see that it is adequately recognized and honored. I want nothing for myself. Oh, there must be something you'll accept. I only have one ambition, of course. Um, I don't attach any conditions. The process is yours. But I would like to do something for my people. It is my most cherished dream to see a national home for the Jews in Palestine. Or some hobby of the Jerusalem. Ang hobby had been a high low gani. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Though I understand your problems and your feelings perhaps better than you can imagine. And I should be very surprised indeed if my knowledge of the Old Testament was any less extensive than your own. See, in the country I come from, we meet every Sunday in buildings called Beulah, Silo, Ebenezer, Bethania, Nazareth. I'll have a word with Mr. Balfour and get the two of you to meet. He's by way of being a scientist himself and is going to be very impressed by this discovery of yours. As for the Palestinian project, and that, of course, is a job for the Foreign Office. No, I can't guarantee the outcome. But I do give you my solemn word, it will be given serious and sympathetic consideration. I am very grateful, Minister. That is just what I expected. In contrast to Herbert Asquith, Lloyd George formed a cabinet of just five men, which was later increased to ten. Rather than mention their jobs, I want to show you their religious backgrounds. And I actually am indebted to Dr. David Schmidt for this analysis. David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, came from a strong Welsh nonconformist tradition. He was raised on the Bible, even if he didn't actually live by it. 
Arthur Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, was a Scottish Presbyterian. He had a very strong Christian mother. Probably he was the most authentic Christian in the cabinet. Jan Christian Smuts was a Calvinist in the Reformed Church of South Africa. Edward Carson was an Irish Presbyterian. Andrew Bonar Law was in the Free Church of Scotland. He was actually asked by the King to become the Prime Minister after Herbert Asquith, but he recommended David Lloyd George instead. Arthur Henderson was a Wesleyan Methodist, converted under Gypsy Smith. He had actually left the cabinet just before the Balfour Declaration was finally agreed. George Barnes, as far as he's known, had no religious affiliation, but we do know that he supported Zionism. George Curzon was nominally Anglican, though not particularly active. Alfred Milner, who was one of the chief authors of the Balfour Declaration, was usually referred to as a Christian. And finally, there is Edwin Montague, who was only the second Jew to serve in a British cabinet, and he was passionately anti-Zionist. He was the main opposition to the Balfour Declaration. He was appointed as Secretary of State for India and was actually on board ship to India when the Balfour Declaration was agreed by the Cabinet. Very cunning move, I think, by the Prime Minister. But he did leave behind a desperate letter to Prime Minister Lloyd George opposing the Declaration. So seven or eight of the ten members of the Cabinet could be counted as Christians of one sort or another. Most of them came from a strong evangelical tradition based on the Bible, particularly true of the two main players, Balfour and Lloyd George. However, agreeing the text of the Declaration was not simple. Cathy Durkin's book sets out in detail what happened between the first draft and the final version. We're not going to go into it all here because it goes on for quite some time, but what we're going to do is look at the beginning and the end. This is how the first draft began. His Majesty's government accepts the principle that Palestine should be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people. By the time we get to the final draft, this had been substantially changed. His Majesty's government views with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The first thing to note is a very subtle but important change. Whereas the first draft talked of Palestine as the national home, it was now just a home. This took on board the fear of the Jews that if it said the, they would all be expected to move there maybe even be expelled from Britain or from whichever other country they were living in. The second major change is that the first draft refers to the Jewish home being reconstituted. This refers back to the time when there was a Jewish state before. Actually, back to the Bible. It demonstrates the Jewish connection to the land. This is now missing from the Declaration, but it actually comes back in later on, as we shall see. Now, the disagreement within the Jewish community about the Declaration caused a real problem for the British government. How could they proceed with a statement concerning Palestine without the agreement of the Jewish community? Chaim Weizmann himself acknowledged the problem. They did not want to perform an act against the will of the Jews, who had a very high social standing and occupied a high position in the British world. Before the cabinet meeting that agreed the declaration, Arthur Balfour said this to Chaim Weizmann, I know 
that with the issue of this declaration, I shall please one group, meaning the Zionists, and displease another, meaning the assimilationists. I have decided to please your group because you stand for a great idea. My impression is that it was Balfour himself who was the driving force behind the declaration, despite opposition and apathy from part of the Jewish community. But a piece of paper does not make something happen. It needed also boots on the ground in Palestine. And the next clip I want to show you is how all this is brought together. And I want to suggest to you, this is something that only God could arrange. The whole scheme would be fruitless unless three things happened. Firstly, the military had to gain a victory on the ground and actually capture Palestine. Secondly, the Zionists' proposal fitted with Britain's imperial plans. And thirdly, the other interested parties, the French, the Russians, the Vatican, the Italians, and especially the American president, Woodrow Wilson, would have to agree. President Wilson was a Bible-believing Christian. He took the word of God literally, and therefore he believed that Israel one day would be restored. It is said that without a nod from Woodrow Wilson, the Balfour Declaration may never have been issued. The final vote would be taken at the War Cabinet meeting in London, scheduled for the 31st of October, 1917. Military plans too had concluded, and the combined British and Anzac assault would take place here at Beersheba, also on the 31st of October. This would be the crucial military assault. British infantry would assault from the south and the west, with the 60th London, the 74th English, the 53rd Welsh and the 10th Irish Division in reserve, while Australian and New Zealand horsemen would attack from the east. To them was entrusted the responsibility of capturing Beersheba. Beersheba had to be captured in one day in order to maintain the element of surprise and in order to secure the crucial water supply from its ancient wells that dated back to the time of Abraham in the book of Genesis. Early in the morning of October the 31st, 1917, the British infantry attacked and later gained their objectives. Then in the early afternoon, the New Zealanders attacked and finally captured their objective, Tel Sheva, the ancient city of Beersheva. Late in the afternoon before the sun set, 800 soldiers of the Australian 4th Light Force Brigade moved out from some hills to the east of Beersheba and charged in at the Turkish trenches, won the positions and captured Beersheba. It was one of the finest military victories in the modern period. On the same afternoon as the battle, the British War Cabinet in London, unaware of the victory in Beersheba, finally ratified the wording of what became known as the Balfour Declaration. The resulting letter to Lord Rothschild was written two days later on the 2nd of November, the same day that news reached London of the Allied victory at Beersheba. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Then you find it amazing that both the agreement of the Balfour Declaration and the Battle of Beersheba both happened on the same day, even the same hour, and they didn't have mobile phones to talk to each other. 
As it said in that clip, two days later, Friday the 2nd of November, the letter to Lord Rothschild was actually written. The liberation of Jerusalem came 40 days after the Battle of Beersheba on the 11th of December, 1917, as we see in this clip. Just 40 days after the Balfour Declaration was made, General Allenby captured Jerusalem from the Turks on the historic Jewish feast of Hanukkah. The liberation of Jerusalem by the British was accompanied by an unusual event. For the first time in history, Allied aircraft flew over the Holy City and dropped leaflets signed by General Allenby, which the Muslim inhabitants read as coming from Allah. This resulted in the city being surrendered without a single shot being fired. The following prophecy by Isaiah highlights one of the most amazing victories during World War I. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. When it's said about the uh, city being surrendered without the shot being fired, that does actually refer only to the old city. They had, there's been quite a lot of fighting in the, the outer part, outside the old city, before that happened. But we still cannot leave the story here because we need to know what happened to the Balfour Declaration. Two and a half years later, an international conference was convened in San Remo to decide what should happen to the territories which were formerly part of the Ottoman Empire. This meeting took place at the Villa Devachan. The Allied Supreme Council comprised the leaders of the nations who came out victorious at the end of World War I. And their job was to allocate the captured land between them. Principles had already been established by Woodrow Wilson, president of the USA, his 14 points as it's called. And that included that there should be no more colonization. But what we should be doing is encouraging self-government of the countries which had now been liberated from the Turks. The actual borders between the Mandate territories were not fixed at San Remo, but left to the mandatory powers to determine. But they, uh, mandates were agreed for the Middle East, for Syria, Lebanon, which was awarded to France, for Mesopotamia, which is what we now call Iraq, which was awarded to Great Britain, and for Palestine, also awarded to Great Britain. The main principle was that the people of each territory should be brought to self-government by the mandatory power in accordance with President Wilson's 14 points. But for Palestine, this would only come about as it became a homeland for the Jewish people and as they returned to their land. The language in use concerning Palestine at this time has a telling terminology. Recognition to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine, reconstituting their national home in that country, recreation of Palestine as the national home of the Jewish race, and rebuilding of their ancient homeland. Notice the re's all pointing back to what had happened before. It's important to see that a Jewish homeland in Palestine was not something new, but a recreation of something that had existed earlier. Recognition of the biblical account, in fact, as being authoritative. Now, the Balfour Declaration was actually incorporated into the Mandate for Palestine at the San Remo Conference in April 1920. But the Mandate did not include any other previous agreements or correspondence. And it's important to note this, because there had been other correspondence during World War I and after. There was the McMahon Agreement the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Faisal-Weizmann Agreement. But none of them were included in the mandate document. The only one that was, was the Balfour Declaration. The mandate was approved unanimously 
by the League of Nations, which is the forerunner of the United Nations, in 1922, and therefore became the legal foundation of the State of Israel. Let's watch a video clip on this. It's in this place that the leaders with the power to make binding dispositions with respect to the Ottoman territories deliberated and made the decision, having heard claims from the Zionist organization in Paris in 1919 during the Paris Peace Conference, having heard submissions from the Arab delegation in respect to what they wanted in the Ottoman territories, having heard these submissions, a group of them gathered here and made final binding decisions in international law as to who would get what. At San Remo, that what had been exclusively a British approach receives the full backing of the international community. And in that sense, uh, Israel's legitimacy is linked to an international decision at San Remo and not just a whim of British policy. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land, and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. In the 1922 Palestine Mandate, the League of Nations together voted on a very special resolution. It decided that they would give recognition to the historic rights of the Jewish people. To do what? To reconstitute their national home. Now, if you look at that language, you see two things. You see they are recognizing a pre-existing right and not creating a new right. In other words, the historical rights of the Jewish people to this land were recognized by the great powers at the time, by the equivalent of the UN at the time. It was the Jewish people that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust, a mandate under the care of the British government in respect to Palestine. It was the in Arab inhabitants of the territories of Mesopotamia, Iraq now, Syria and Lebanon that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust or a mandate. Part of it under the trusteeship of or mandate of the French, Syria and Lebanon, part of it under British supervision, Mesopotamia. I want to underline that the primary objective of the mandate for Palestine was to grant political rights and respect to Palestine to the Jewish people. The civil and religious rights of the Arabs as individuals were fully protected in the uh, mandate document. But insofar as the national and collective rights and the collective political rights um, uh, were concerned, these were reserved exclusively for the Jewish people because uh, the Arabs were given those same rights, not in Palestine, but in the neighboring countries. And that is why today, you have 21 Arab states and one Jewish state. The mandate for Palestine was quite different from the others. The primary objective was to provide a home for the Jewish people, including Jewish people dispersed worldwide in their ancestral home, as they alone among the peoples of the world had no other homeland. It is important to see the distinction between the mandate for Palestine, which is the document, and the mandatory power, which is Britain. They are two separate entities, okay? So the trust is there as a document that says this is what needs to happen, and the mandatory power, Britain in this case, is there to, to make sure it does happen. Britain had to abide by the terms of the trust, the mandate that is to say, and in fact had to report to a League of Nations commission every year to give an account of its stewardship of the mandate. This map shows the original area covered by the mandate for Palestine. 
Now, Article 25 of the mandate gave Britain permission to deal with the east bank of the Jordan differently. Quote, in the territories lying between the Jordan and the eastern boundary of Palestine, <clears throat> as ultimately determined, the mandatory shall be entitled, with the consent of the Council of the League of Nations, to postpone or withhold application of such provision of this mandate as he may consider inapplicable to the existing local conditions. And the full permission of the League of Nations was granted on the 16th of September 1922. This was specifically for the benefit of the Arab population of Palestine, and Jews were banned from living there, as they still are today. Now, as far as the Jews were concerned, the mandate for Palestine now covered the area shown here as Jewish Palestine, less than one quarter of the original territory. But it was specifically there to become a Jewish homeland. Nearly 30 years later, Britain gave notice that she was giving up the responsibility of administering the mandate for Palestine. And this led to the United Nations taking action. The UN had taken over from the League of Nations after the Second World War. And the UN came up with a proposed partition plan, which is known as Resolution 181. So this was the original area that comprised Palestine, both sides of the River Jordan. And this shows their proposals for Western Palestine, or Jewish Palestine. And it includes two states within Western Palestine. One, a Jewish one, that's the lighter colored area on the map, largely in the desert, all that southern part is desert and one Arab one, which is the darker shading. And Jerusalem would be an international city. Now, Resolution 181 was only a recommendation and not an instruction. So when the Arabs refused to accept the, re the, re the recommendation, which they did, it became null and void. Despite the injustice to the Jews, they accepted the partition plan. They could see the desperate need to provide a home for the displaced persons and Holocaust survivors after World War II who were being refused access to Palestine by Britain. So, as Britain's mandate expired, Israel declared itself an independent country. <laughs> At 4 p.m. in Tel Aviv, the leaders of the Jewish community headed by David Ben-Gurion gathered together to declare the rebirth of the State of Israel in her ancient homeland. I can still remember looking out from right in the middle of Jerusalem, where I was, King George Avenue, and seeing an Israeli flag go up over what was then Barclays Bank. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, when I saw that flag, this must be significant. I mean, I didn't have any real insight into biblical prophecy at the time, but I thought, this has to be a special day. And it certainly won. Well, I hope you realise from what you've just been seeing how important the Balfour Declaration is, not just for Israel, but also for Britain as well. And because of its importance, it was right that we should have a proper celebration of that. And that we did at the Royal Albert Hall in London on the 7th of November 2017. And we're going to see a short clip from that in just a moment when the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom is part of the speech that he gave at the uh, end of that celebration. So before we show that, I just want to say thank you very much indeed for uh, watching through this whole programme. I know it's been quite a long thing to look through. Thank you very much for doing that. Really, God bless you for that. Shalom. And now over to Mark Regev, the Israeli ambassador. And I believe, I believe very firmly 
that it is the right thing to do to celebrate the Balfour Declaration. Thank you for that. Because in issuing the Balfour Declaration, the United Kingdom stood up for what is right. The United Kingdom stood up for justice. The United Kingdom looked at the Jewish people and said, here is a people that has been in exile, that has been dispersed, that has been scattered amongst the nations, a people that had been discriminated against, a people that had been persecuted, a people that faced horrors, maybe, maybe like no other people. And it said, this people also deserves the right to be free. This people, this people deserves the right to a homeland. This people deserves the right to independence. And the Balfour Declaration played a crucial role in galvanizing international support for Zionism and allowing my people to return home and re-establish our national freedom. But there is one other reason why I think all of us can be proud of the Balfour Declaration. Not only did you do the right thing by the Jewish people, you did the right thing for another reason. Because in having a hand in helping to re-establish the Jewish state, you also played a role in establishing the Middle East's only strong, stable democracy. Here in the United Kingdom, you have a history. You have the mother of parliaments. You have the Magna Carta. You have individual liberties, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom to organize. These are freedoms that originated in many ways in this great land. And when you look at the Middle East and you look at all those countries, you see despotism after despotism after despotism. You see autocracy and autocracy. There is only one country that stands out as a beacon of liberty and freedom, where democratic elections take place, where the press is free, where the population is free, and that is my country. That is Israel. And so you can be proud of the role that you played, that Britain played, in helping to establish the Middle East's only democracy. So I say to each and every one of you, those who've come from near and those who've come from far, that all of you have come tonight to this important event to celebrate a centenary to the Balfour Declarations. I say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your support, thank you for your prayers, thank you for your solidarity. It is appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>